All right. What's up, y'all? Hey, let's give it up for our band. Man, love you guys so much. Super thankful for y'all. I can already tell y'all this is going to be the party crowd. Okay? I can tell. It's because you got an extra hour of sleep. Just kidding. You got more sleep than first service. How about that? You good with that? Does that make sense? Cool. I know. Oh, man. Hey, well, my name is Chuck Jeff Coates. Uh, as, as Kamadi said, I am the uh, worship pastor here. My wife and I get the chance to pastor our life groups here in town, too. And so uh, we love being a part of New Life. Man, it's just such a blessing to be here in Heber Springs. Y'all, come on. Woo! Well, listen, today we're going to jump into the Word. We're going to be talking about the testing of our faith. Okay? It's going to get a little punchy. That's what we need, though, right? So we're going to talk about the testing of our faith. So God's people... We walk by faith, right? So we live by faith. In fact, God's people, they always have. In fact, you know, when we became Christ followers, that's what we had to do. We had to put our faith in Jesus, right? So that's what got us started in the process anyways, is putting faith into Jesus. And so without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith, it believes before it even sees, Faith believes before it sees. In fact, the Bible tells us to walk by faith and not by sight, right? Okay, so today we're going to look at the life of Abraham. And uh, Abraham, he's known as the father of our faith. And You guys remember a song about Abraham? Yeah. Anybody remember that? Well, listen, I grew up Baptist, and I'm almost positive this is the only song that you were able to sing and move your body parts to. <laughs> so, anybody relate to that? <laughs> Well, listen, uh, yeah, so the, the Abraham, he's the father of faith is what he's referred to. And so in the life of Abraham, we're going to look at four different tests that he went through in his life. And four main tests that, that are really only passed by faith. And this will be something that we can obviously relate to. A lot of these tests, if not all of these tests, we've all had experience in. And so I'm going to try to see if we can dig into the word and let the Lord help us in this area. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so uh, tests. Anybody love tests in here? No, every single person says no. I like y'all. Y'all are my favorite. Uh, well, listen, you know, when you, when you grow up, you go through all kinds of different tests. So I remember in, uh, in junior high, I was a part of the basketball team. And uh, the coach that we had at the time was like, he was our principal, but he was like six foot seven probably 300 pounds. He was, a, he was just all muscled. He was huge. He could, y'all, he could sit on his butt at half court and he could shoot and make, make the ball. He could make the goal. Isn't that crazy? Like on his butt. And so one of the fun things that we got to go through as junior high kids, the test that we got to prove ourselves in was anytime we in practice, we would do free throws. If we airballed a free throw, he just, he was under the goal. He would grab the ball and he would just throw it as hard as he possibly could at our faces. <laughs> Trust me, I didn't always pass that test. I probably had the scars to prove that. But that's one test growing up. You know, obviously, you guys remember probably finals. Anybody remember taking finals in here? That's a big test, right? James remembers. Uh, that's one test I'm pretty sure I never studied for, just to be honest, okay? And I didn't do well on them, so... Uh, <laughs> Proof's in the pudding, right? Okay, so my favorite, though, um, you guys remember open book tests? Yeah, that's what's up, right? Yeah, it's easy to take a test when the answers are sitting in front of you. Yeah, that's my favorite part. What about pop quizzes? Those are the worst, right? Oh, my goodness. I feel like if I remember back, anytime a pop quiz would arise, I just didn't really feel that good. And I, I would have to ask to go see the nurse, you know? That only worked out like one time, probably, and then she caught on to what's going on. But listen, God, he wants you to pass his tests, okay? God, he wants you to know him, and the more that you learn about him, the more that you know him. And the more that you know him, the more that you trust him. And the more that you trust him, the more faith that you're going to have in the middle of these tests to endure them, right? To pass them. And so your faith is going to be tested, and it's almost going to come out like the it's almost always going to come out like the pop quiz form, okay? It's going to come out of nowhere. Oftentimes, these tests arise. It's not like you're like, there's going to be a test down the road. It's going to be hard. 
I know it. No, it's like, bam, it's in my face, right? That's how it works. So let's look at the life of Abraham. Let's look at these tests. The first test, it should be in your notes there. You can write this down. The first test is life changes. Life changes, okay? Let's dig into the scripture. So Hebrews chapter 11, 8 through 10. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as in his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were, his, who were heirs with him in foundation, him uh, the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. So the first test of life that he sees right here is, is a major life change, a major change in his life. So God asked Abraham to pick up everything that he had and to move to another place. Well, what do you think the first question he asked was? Where? Where am I going, right? He asked where. I mean, that's a valid question, I would say. You tell me to move somewhere, I'll be like, okay, where do you want me to go? Okay, so Abraham, he asked where. Uh, this is the first test. It's, it's like the, the where question right here is what it looks like. And so it's like, God, where am I going? And God's just like, I'll tell you later. I'll, I'll let you know. It's okay. It's like, how long is this going to take to get there? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll let you know. It's not a big deal. Well, how do I, how do I know when I get there? Oh, uh, you'll know. I, I, I promise. I, I'll, I'll tell you later. It's like, okay, would you, would you follow God like that? I mean, just, you know, that's the type of faith we're called to have sometimes is like this, almost like blind faith, right? Well, do you guys remember the verse that talks about God's word is like a lamp into our feet and a light into our path? Well, I've been taught that my whole life, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I heard a little bit more of a deeper meaning of that. And you think about holding like a lamp or like a lantern out in the darkness. What does that look like? Well, you can only see a few feet around you, right? That's not enough light to light up the entire world. And so that's how God's word works, is he gives you a few steps at a time. You can see where you're at, but he doesn't always give you the whole picture. And I think that's because he's trying to build our faith. If we saw the whole picture, if we knew all the answers, there would be no reason to trust God because we just like never have faith. You know, because we know what's going to happen, right? And so he's building our faith in those times. Listen, when I was uh, 23, I was uh, the youngest manager at a lumber company chain here in Arkansas uh, that the company had ever had. And it was in northeast Arkansas in Blavel. Anybody from Blavel? No. Y'all don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> you only say Blavel if you're from Blavel. It's Blytheville. For those of you, they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense now, right? Okay. So I was, I was the manager at this store, this lumber company, and uh, one day I go and I open the store. Our employees are all there, and uh, we get the, the store open, and uh, probably about 30 minutes after we open the store, the owner calls me, and I'm like, hey, and uh, he says, uh, just wanted to call and let you know I've got two guys coming up there to shut down the store. We're going to close the store for good. And I was like, What? And so it, like, freaked me out, right? I'm like, what, 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 first off, what's happening? But then also, like, what am I supposed to do? And so we spent the next two weeks, like, cleaning out the store and cleaning out the lumber yard, uh, getting it all back to the main office. And uh, luckily, there was a job opening at the home office that I was able to apply for and get. So the Lord took care of me. But I was scared in the process, right? I didn't know what was going to happen. I was 23, living on my own. What am I going to do next? And so the Lord made a, made a way for me to come down to central Arkansas, get delivered from northeast Arkansas. Anybody in here? Flat farmland. It's good to see, but you don't want to live there. I don't know. So, but anyways, that's a major life change, right? That's a major transition. And this is what Abraham is experiencing here, and it's difficult for him too. In fact, Abraham, this dude was 75 years old when this happened. I thought it was bad at 23, but here he is, he's probably ready, ready to retire from some things, right? He's ready to start taking it easy, and God said, how about some new things? It's going to be good. And so he's like, oh, okay, uh, you know, I was going to try to take it easy, but I guess I could probably have a great adventure. That'd be fun, right? And so not only that, but 
he was wealthy too, so he had a lot to move. I mean, he had cattle, he had camels, he had sheep, he had servants. He had a lot to worry about and to think about, but yet he, he picked up everything that he had and he took off. He, he, he immediately took off. And so you're going to have to have these where questions all throughout your life. The Lord's going to present these opportunities to you, and you're not always going to know the answers, but you're going to have these square questions, like even, even younger. So like, where's my locker, Lord? Where's my locker? I don't even know where it's at. What about where am I going to go to college? You know, it starts getting more serious as life goes on a lot of times. Where will I work? Am I going to work at the Piggly Wiggly? Am I going to work at Kmart? Who knows? Those actually still exist, as odd as that is. I didn't think they did, but I looked it up. That's the internet it. The internet knows. So what about this? Where will I transition to? Like, especially later when it comes down to this time in my life when I'm retiring, I want to slow down and settle down. Where's that going to be? Heber Springs, obviously, right? Just like everybody else. <laughs> but listen, with every where question that arises, will you trust God? Will you trust God to know that he's going to take care of it? And so Abraham's attitude is this. Like, if I'm putting my faith in you forever, then I've got full faith in you for my today and for my tomorrow. Like if I'm expecting heaven, if I know that's really the end goal, then I'm going to be totally fine with wherever you have me here because I know it's only temporary, right? And so God, I trust you with all my wares in life. It's this where faith that we've got to have. And God says, start moving and then I will direct you. But a lot of times we have to take that first step I know it's scary sometimes, but we've got to take that first step, and he'll take care of things. And so we just respond with like, yes, sir, I'm going, right? Okay, second test. Write this down. The waiting test. Yeah, y'all love this one, right? It's a lot of fun. Look at chapter uh, 11, verse 9. It says, by faith, faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. And so there's a word here that's used twice in this sentence. You see it? It's the word promise. Okay? Circle it. You know, in your Bible, circle it in your notes. And so I think it's a very important word in our vocabulary that we need to get to know. Because the question here is when. But God said, I'm going to give you the promised land. He had a promise for Abraham. And Abraham wanted to know when. He had this question as well. When's this going to happen? In fact, Abraham not only wanted to or waited his whole life, but he actually waited a long time of, of Jacob's life and of Isaac's life. It's just three generations of people living in tents, right? They couldn't even settle down into a, like a, a structure. It's just a temporary tent. Y'all, I remember uh, hearing this story uh, of my papa. So growing up, uh, my, my papa, he, uh, he would sit around the house, you know, and uh, he, telemarketers would call the time. You guys know about that, you know. I, it's funny, telemarketers have changed over the time because now it's like they just steal your money before they at least gave you something for your money, even though it was useless, right? So things have changed, right? But my papa, he would talk to these telemarketers, and he loved to mess with them. Anybody relate to that? So he loved to mess with these guys. And so I had this, he had this uh, guy call him one time asking him or trying to get him to buy house siding. And so he, he sits and he lets, lets him give his spiel and he waits it out. And then uh, at the end of the guy's spiel, he says, well, sir, I don't know that I'd be interested in that because I think my tent would look awful weird with siding on it. And so the guy was like, okay, well, thank you for your time. And then hung up. Isn't that crazy? That dude believed that my papa was living in a tent on a phone. Isn't that crazy? Oh, my gosh, what in the world? And so how would you like to live in a tent for three generations? That seems super intense, right? I mean, could you imagine, like, Sarah, his wife, is like, Abraham, when are you going to give me a real house here, okay? I'm tired of sweeping dirt out the dirt, okay? When is life going to stabilize? Like, when are we going to settle in? And so, look, look, I can handle a test in my life. If I know there's going to be an end to it, like if I can see that there's an end, but the hardest kinds of tests in my life are when you really don't know when it's going to end. 
that's when it's difficult. You don't see that end in sight. And that's a promise that's like on pause, right? It's like delayed, and you're just unsure about the whole situation. But look, Abraham here, he never gave up. And so the principle I think we should, we should gain here is a true believer trusts in God's timing. I mean, wholeheartedly. It's like, God, I know that your timing is good and pleasing and perfect, and so I'm going to trust in that. Amen? But listen, everyone has struggled with this, okay? We can see it all throughout the Bible. In fact, look at David in, in Psalm 13, verses 1 through 2. He said, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And so David, he's stuck in this place, and he's crying out to God. He's just saying, how long? How? He says it four times, which means he's pretty serious, right? He's in despair, and he's looking to God to give him answers. And listen, I, I understand what it's like to be stuck into, in a place. I, I, I feel like every time I get sick, I always get in my brain like, this is how I'm going to feel the rest of my life. Anybody, you get like a cold, it's like, this is it. This is the new norm, right? Anybody there? But listen, the principle, again, is a true believer trusts in God's timing, okay? And so some of you guys are going through this wind test right now. You're asking questions like, when are things going to get better in my marriage, Lord? When am I going to get married? When am I going to have a baby? When am I going to get well? It's been so long, Lord. I've been sick for so long. When am I going to get well? When am I going to stop being depressed? And when are you going to solve my problem? When are you going to answer my prayers, Lord? I've been praying these same prayers for years, and I feel like I have not gotten an answer yet. And listen, I want everyone in here right now to think about that thing that you've been waiting on. Just think about that thing. Bring it to your mind right now. And I want everyone to say out loud, I trust God's timing. Come on, say that. I trust God's timing. We need to get this. We need to remember that, right? And so waiting, I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's a great test. It's a real good opportunity for growth. I know it's not easy, but it's a great opportunity for growth. Um, summer of 2021, my family and I, it's me and my wife Amy, and then our two boys, uh, they were 10 and five at the time, something like that. We decided to take our first like legit big time road trip. And uh, so we took off uh, from here and went up to Mount Rushmore and then went over from Mount Rushmore into like Wyoming, down into Colorado, did a lot of camping and stuff. It was awesome. And we got to Colorado Springs and uh, we decided to eat lunch at Steak and Shake. And so we go in Steak and Shake and again, it's 2021. So things are still a little bit COVID weird. You know what I'm talking about, you guys? Anybody in here? Okay, so uh, we get in, inside Steak and Shake, and, and we order, and there's some more people that are behind us that end up ordering, but there are only two workers in this restaurant. The manager is there, and then there's a cook. And so we're sitting there, and we're waiting. Obviously, they're a little frustrated because they're the only ones there. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the cook, his time, his shift is up. He just bails on her. He didn't care. He didn't wait for the next cook to come in or anything. And so my amazing wife, like, she talks to this manager, and she's like, hey, is there anything we can do for you? Because you could obviously tell she was devastated. Now she's got to do all this stuff by herself. And so uh, we, me and, and Amy and the boys, we grabbed a couple of rags, and we start busting tables and stuff. It was a lot of fun, and uh, the, the other cook ended up coming in. But this dude, he bailed on her, right? He couldn't wait. And isn't that the temptation, though? Like, I don't know when it's going to happen, so I search for the quickest way out to meet my own need. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. I want to be able to suit my own need. And listen, oftentimes we get what we pray for by fulfilling that prayer ourselves, right? We take the step, and we, we, we think we know better and we, we reach around, and when we get what God maybe planned later on, or maybe he didn't even plan for us at all, and we, we get what we think we need. I mean, Abraham did this. If you remember, waiting for this promise of a child, he goes out, and, and Haggai, his, his, Hagar, his servant, and he goes and, and impregnates her, 
And you got Ishmael that's born from that. And then I don't know if you know, but the line of Ishmael really caused chaos for the entire world. We're still in that. Okay. And so you can see while rushing the process can really cause some damage, guys. And so there's some counterfeits out there that are going to make you think that it's the right thing to do. But if you're not trusting God, if you're not listening for God, his direction, you're going to make a mistake. And so listen, if you're waiting, I, I promise you this, you're in great company. We've all had to wait. Moses, he waited 80 years for God's promise. Noah waited 120 years. Listen, Lazarus, that brother died. He died. Everybody else is like, God, you got to do something soon because he's starting to stink, okay? <laughs> but listen, we've got to settle within ourselves right now that we are totally content with God's timing, amen? Okay, test number three. Y'all ready? Impossibility, the impossibility test. Let's go on and look at verses 11 and 12. It says, and by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, talking about Abraham, and he as good as dead, that sounds real encouraging, right? <laughs> Came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Oh, snap. No, that's gross. No, turn it off. That's not good. Now, Abraham was 99 years old. Abraham was 99 years old, and, and he, didn't, he didn't have a kid yet, but the Bible stated, the Bible even said he's as good as dead. Like, anybody want to get with that man? But, but God still was saying, he still was saying that, that Abraham was going to be the father of a great nation, right? In fact, God had already changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of many nations. How embarrassing is that? It's like, it makes me think of like, you know, you got like a seven foot tall guy that everybody calls tiny, but like makes no sense at all. So I can imagine Abraham like being in a conversation with a guy. It's like, hey, what's your name? Uh, my name is Father of Many Nations. It's like, oh, really? How many kids you got? Uh, none yet, yet. None yet, okay. Uh, how old are you? I'm 99. <laughs> Y'all, Abraham wrote the song, I got 99 problems, but a kid ain't one. <laughs> right? It's an impossible problem. In fact, it's, it's physically impossible because, you know, think about Sarah. Sarah has already gone through menopause at least twice. <laughs> I don't know how that works. I'm a man, so <laughs> it's all right. Listen, the Bible, the Bible says, when God said that you're going to have a child, it actually says that they laughed. And what did they end up naming their kid? They named him Isaac, which means laughter. And so Abraham, he looked at himself, and he's like, <laughs> this is funny. Sarah looked at herself, like, this ain't happening. They looked at each other, like, uh-uh. Mm -mm. God, that's gross. But listen, God had the last laugh, right? God had the last laugh. And so, listen, an impossible problem is when you wonder how. How can this even happen? And so, not when, not where, but how. Like, how are you going to do it, Lord? How is this even possible? I mean, think about other people in the, in the Bible that had impossible situations that God pulled them through. I think about Daniel as who comes to my mind. I think about this dude gets thrown into a pit full of lions, and they put a big giant stone over the top of it. They leave him there overnight. And they remove the stone the next morning, and the dude is still alive. He's, he's untouched. The Bible said that, the, that God sent an angel down to close the lion's mouths. I really think that that angel, it didn't say in the Bible, but I really think that the angel declawed the lions as well. Because those are quite sharp as well, right? Okay. But listen, an impossible problem, it's the house of life. And I know, listen, some of you are really worried and you're really discouraged, and you're down saying, I just don't know how God is going to do this. This seems way too big. It seems impossible. And you don't know how God's going to help you. You're asking questions like, how am I going to make ends meet this month? 
How am I going to put my kids through college? God, how are you going to heal me? How are, how are you going to help me step into the ministry you've called to be called me to be in? How like, how are you going to change my my wife? How are you going to change my husband, my kids, my boss? Look, the key to faith is to expect a miracle even if you haven't figured out the how yet. You live that way. You think it may seem impossible to me, but with God, all things are possible. And so I'm expecting God to move in that way. And so faith, it focuses on God's power more than man's limitations. Okay? The fourth test is pain. It's not the when, it's not the where, it's not the how, it's the why. Why is this happening, God? Like this, I really think this is the ultimate test. And Abraham faced it. And if you have never faced like serious pain, you will at some point in your life. It's just a fact of the part of the world that we live in. In fact, the world doesn't make sense, right? And people try to say like it's not fair, but where did we ever hear that it's supposed to be fair in the first place? In fact, if you look back in Genesis after Adam and Eve had sinned and fallen, the Lord actually told them how hard life was about to be for them. He told us it was going to be a difficult path when we chose the, our own will above his. And so listen, this next part of Abraham's life, it gives more people questions in the Bible than, than anything else. I think a lot of people have a problem with this story, but listen, it's when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his own son. Isaac is this, you know, this miracle boy, this promised child, the one in whom Abraham's hopes and dreams were wrapped up in, this promise from God, and this is the guy that Abraham's supposed to sacrifice. Look, he represented everything that Abraham held dear. And by the way, did you, did you know that, that that represents a picture of what Jesus came and fulfilled for us? It was God's only son, all his hopes and dreams. But Abraham can't see this at the time. He didn't know this side of God yet. Our response to that is typical, like it's unfair, right? It, we're in shock that this would even happen. I mean, th this isn't Christianity. It's not supposed to happen this way. But let's look at it. Chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And even though, God, even though God said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Look at this. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. And look, Abraham, he, he reasons his faith over his emotion. I think he probably had to reach deep to do this, but he chose to have faith that God knew what he was doing and there was a purpose behind it. And again, he didn't really know God like we know God now because Jesus had not come yet. He had not seen that that's the way that God operates. He provides a sacrifice. He didn't know that God was loving and compassionate that way. All he could see is God is telling me to kill my son. Listen, there's a lot in this world that doesn't make sense. I get that. It's a test. It's a test of, of his commitment to us, honestly, is what it is. Look back at verse 19. Abraham said, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did re receive Isaac back from death. And so Abraham, listen... He had a faith that I think is just hard to attain, but Abraham had this dead-raising faith, this rock-solid, dead-raising faith. Abraham said, no matter what, no matter what happens right here, I'm trusting God. And so some of the why questions you may be facing right now is, why, God, why did I get fired? Why did my spouse have to leave? 
why did my, my kid run off and get on dope? Why, why am I going bankrupt? Why, God? Like, why am I having this? Why did I have this miscarriage? Why did my parents have to die? Or why did that accident have to happen? Like, it seems so senseless, right? It seems so tragic. But listen, God, I'm trusting you with this. You see perfectly and you see eternally. You are good, and so I'm trusting you with everything that I have, with every decision made, I trust you in that. I'm gonna end on this scripture right here. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It's a tough scripture, but I really think that it brings so much life to us. James 1, verses two and two through four. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, any test, right, of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So what test are you going through? Are you going through the where, the when, the how, or the why? And and how are you seeing these tests as a chance for your faith to grow, to produce endurance in your life, in your faith life to produce endurance and strength. Can I pray for you? First off, in this idea of faith, I wanna make sure first and foremost that you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is where your faith process begins. It can't start anywhere else. It's trusting that Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for you that you should have paid yourself. He stepped in your place. He died the death that you were supposed to die so that you could live. You could be in right relationship with God once again. If you've never made that decision before, I want to give you that opportunity. So if you would, just raise your hand and look up at me. You want to say, Jesus, I I want you to be Lord of my life. If you've never done that before, just look up at me until I see you. Well, listen, maybe maybe you've made that decision. But maybe you've kind of gone in a different direction. You know, when the Bible talks about repentance, repentance, what it is, is you're going in one direction and you completely turn around and you go a different direction. That's what repentance is. That's going to God and saying, look, I've been living my own way. I've been making my own choices, but I want to choose you. I know that you know what's right. Maybe you've, you've known that once before. You've made Jesus the Lord, but you've walked away from that. And you want to come back to the Lord. You want to say, Lord, I just, I want to recommit myself to you, my life, my decisions. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand and look up at me. I want to pray for you as well. Yes, I see you back there. Yes, I see you over there. Amen. Well, Lord, we just come before you and we're just so thankful for all that you do for us, Lord. Even the things that we don't even have eyes to see, Lord, we know that you are taking care of us. Lord, you know the plan you have for us. You know the purpose you've placed in our lives. Lord, I just pray that anybody here that has any sin that they've not asked for forgiveness, Lord, I pray that they would just lay that at the foot of the cross. Jesus does not have to get back up on the cross to die for that again. He's already paid the price, and we're so thankful for that, Lord. Forgive us. Lord, I pray for anybody here that's, that's walked away, that maybe has started living for themselves again. Lord, I pray that they would turn themselves around and, and just run at you full force because we know that you're standing there with your arms wide open ready to receive us. Lord, around this topic of faith, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to 
to trust you more in every area of our life with every decision. Lord, I thank you that you give us clarity of mind. I thank you that you give us this faith and this hope and this peace your Holy Spirit brings us. So, Lord, we just continue to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.